technically this commander hasn't come out yet. So I don't know what price it will be ultimately, but it is a rare, and I doubt that there's going to be a lack of supply of Modern Horizons 3 product in the air. So I think we're pretty safe in saying that uh, the Necrobloom is likely not going to be the uh, $8 it's currently projected as. But I don't know. You tell me. Let me know in the comments section if I end up being right or wrong that the card should end up slipping under a dollar after a while. But anywho, let's talk about what this thing is and what we're going to be doing with it to build a $15 deck. If you know the card Field of the Dead, Necro Bloom is just Field of the Dead, but as a commander. So it has a landfall ability. Whenever a land enters the battlefield, make an 0-1 green plant creature token. That's pretty similar to a lot of other cards we already have. But if we have seven or more lands with different names, create a 2-2 black zombie creature token instead. This also gives all the land cards on our graveyard dredge too, making it very easy to fill our graveyard with land cards and also gives us the ability to play a reanimation strategy if we so choose by dumping a ton of things into the graveyard. So that's basically what we're going to be doing today. This is Necrobloom, and we are going to be playing it as a Landfall Aristocrat's Commander. We are not going to be engaging in the combat phase too much. We are going to be bludgeoning people to death with burn damage, however. Let's get into it. So let's talk core strategy and what an Aristocrat deck is. So basically, an Aristocrat deck is just any deck that wants to generate lots of advantage by sacrificing its things. It was named after a combination of cards like Cartel Aristocrat and the idea of you being the nobility literally sacrificing your peasants for your own personal gain. So there's a lot of layers of interaction that go into Aristocrat decks, and if you've been around my channel long enough, you know that I heavily favor these kind of strategies because they have a lot of variants, and I think they're just really, really fun. So let's go ahead and look at our first one of these aristocrats so you can see what we are going to be doing. This is Elos Ilkor, Sadistic Pilgrim, and she is a fantastic example of how we are going to be winning our games. Anytime we have another creature enter the battlefield, we will gain a life, and anytime one of those creatures dies, each opponent will lose one life. Now, Elos Ilkor will generate us a life every time we get a token with Necro Bloom, and anytime one of its tokens die, we will end up burning people for one. Elos Ilkor does a ton of work in this deck, but it is supplemented heavily by other cards. So let's look at those as well. We are generating tons of tokens. So Nadir's Nightblade, which says anytime one of our tokens leaves the battlefield, every opponent loses one life and we gain a life. And also Mirkwood Bats, which says anytime we create or sacrifice a token, each opponent will lose one life. Then we have Cruel Celebrant. Anytime Cruel Celebrant or another creature or Planeswalker we control dies, each opponent will lose one life and we will gain one life. Bastion of Remembrance, which creates its own token, while also saying that if a creature dies uh, on our board, we get to make each opponent lose one life and we gain one life. But we can double up on these effects. So all of these effects are additive right now. Anytime we have one Elos Ilkor type card, Necro Bloom gets to make tokens, the tokens die, people burn for one. Add a Nadir's Nightblade, now they're burning for two. Add a Cruel Celebrant, now they're burning for three. But we can make these effects multiply Applicative instead if we stack on aristocrats like Dina Soul Steeper and Marauding Blight Priest. Marauding Blight Priest says whenever we gain life, each opponent will lose one life. And Dina says the same thing with giving us our first instance of a sack outlet. She can sack a creature and give herself XO until end of turn, where X is that creature's power. So one of our strategies we can use is if an opponent has a clear board, we can have Dina sack a shit ton of our tokens that we've created from our commander and punch them in the face with them. The other thing, though, is that we might not ever need to engage in a combat step in this deck. Because if we have, say, Elos Ilkor and Cruel Celebrant, like I said, they are additive. We go from one damage to two damage. But if you stack a Dina Soul Steeper on there, she reads both of these life gain triggers and burns our opponent for one damage for each instance, effectively doubling the damage that any amount of aristocrats we already have on the board are doing. And any other instances of life gain that we get access to, she will end up supplementing them as well. In fact, it's almost like you could make a whole really good deck around just Dina Soul Steeper. Maybe that's something we'll do in a later video. 
maybe we'll make both a full power and a uh, a sized down version of Adina Soul Steeper. And maybe there's some other particular uh, things we'll go over when we get to that video. But anywho, let's continue with the core strategy. Next, we need lots of ways to generate tokens and ways to sacrifice our cards to trigger our various aristocrats themselves. Let's start with the sack outlets first because our commander is already doing the bulk of the token generation for us. We have six dedicated sack outlets that are not called Dina Soul Steeper, and let's get into what each of them are and what they are doing for us. This is Baron Bertram Grey Water. Whenever one or more tokens enter the battlefield under our control, make a 1 1 black vampire rogue creature token with lifelink. One each turn. So, it's also got the ability to sack a creature or artifact to draw us a card, which is important, but not as important as its ability is right now. So, let's go ahead and go over something Baron can do for us. Let's say that we drop a land on our board. Let's say it's this escape tunnel right here. Escape Tunnel touches the board, and we generate a zombie token or a plant token, doesn't really matter which one, because of the power of the Necro Bloom. Then our other creature here that we have talked about, uh, our Baron, is going to generate a 1-1 one, one token for us. If we hold on to that land's ability and don't use it immediately, we can then wait for our opponent's next turn. Once their turn comes around, we can sacrifice the escape tunnel, and even though Baron only gives us a 1-1 one, one creature once a turn, by using our lands on other people's turns, we can effectively get more out of him, instead of using the lands immediately. The lands we get from sacking our lands generally come into play tapped anyway, so it makes no strategic difference for us if we use them now or if we use them later. But if we have these once per turn effects like Baron, we can get extra utility out of them by pushing them further and further by getting not one but two maybe even sometimes three triggers of baron's ability a turn cycle remember that our commander also has dredge two attached to all of our lands which means whenever we would draw a card like with baron we can instead choose to put one of our lands like escape tunnel back into our hand that will effectively allow us to keep using this strategy to keep generating tokens over and over and over again until the cows come home. Just remember that these one and repeatable sack effects that get us draw that we're going to be abusing in this deck do happen to have a lot of utility with the dredge effect of our commander. Next, we have Phyrexian Ghoul. It can sack a creature to give itself 2-2 until end of turn. Like with Dina, this can be used as a quick haymaker to finish somebody off, or it can be used just for the fact that it is a free sack outlet that doesn't take anything from us to use. Same with Viscera Seer, who sacks a creature to scry us for one. Then we have Vampiric Rites, which, like Baron, can sack a creature to draw us a card and gain us a life. Skullport Merchant can do the same thing, but he also allows us to draw a card uh, with his effect without giving us any life gain. But he gives us a treasure when he comes out, which makes up for that. A little bit of ramp in case we have to pay some extra command tax. You never know. But that treasure also comes in handy when you look at our last sack outlet, Trading Post. This is an omni tool that lets us do all kinds of wacky things. We can either discard a card to gain four life, triggering Dina Soul Steeper and our Marauding Blight Priest. We can either we can pay a life to generate a goat creature token. We can sack a creature to get an artifact from our graveyard back to our hand, or we can sack an artifact to draw a card. Any number of these effects help us out a ton, and even if we don't necessarily need that artifact fact from our graveyard post haste it still helps us a ton to have access to easy sack outlets especially ones that are as modal as trading post Next, we need more token production. Of course, Baron is supplementing our commander a lot, but we need some other ways to generate tokens, either from deaths of creatures or from lands entering the battlefield. So we've got three ways of doing that. Emiria Angel being one, it's got flying and landfall. Anytime a land enters the battlefield under our control, we can make a 1-1 one, one white bird token. This will effectively give us another copy of our commander's ability because we don't care about the stats, the tokens we create. We just care that they are useful for sacrificing. Retreat to Emeria gives us this ability as well, making a 1-1 one, one white core creature token. Uh, it also lets us give all our creatures 1-1 one, one until end of turn. If we have the ability to get a lot of lands out, this can be a pseudo overrun-ish type effect we have access to. But in my experience, you won't have a board 
big enough for long enough to make use of this particular ability. In an ideal world, your tokens only ever exist on the board for a little bit of time, and then they disappear very, very quickly. Then we have Ogre Slumlord, which says whenever another non-token creature dies, you may create a 1-1 one, one black rat creature token, and it gives the rats death touch as well. This means that anytime any creature dies on anybody's board, we make a token as many times as we want. So let's say we drop down something nutty like this Plague Crafter, making everybody sack one creature. Then Ogre Slumlord sees that and says, oh, I guess I make four rats today because four creatures have died, so long as everybody is sacrificing a non-token creature. Ideally, you should be pushing enough pressure on your opponents that they don't feel like they are safe in generating tokens. They should be spending all of their time removing your things from the board. But of course, removing your things from the board will only work so well because we have a nine card reanimation package we can use to constantly get back stuff from our graveyard either into our hand or onto the battlefield the end of the hand comes courtesy of timeless witness which will let us get any card from our graveyard to our hand and we can eternalize it if we are in a pinch which just lets us create a token copy of it from the grave while exiling it from the grave otherwise that of rebirth says anytime a creature dies we can can put an oil counter on it and then we can remove four oil counters to reanimate any creature at sorcery speed we also have access to sun titan and redemption choir which are uh, basically sun titan's illegitimate offspring Redemption Choir says that whenever it enters the battlefield or attacks, if you control three or more creatures with different powers, return a permanent card with mana value three or less from your graveyard to the battlefield. Redemption Choir is a 3-3, and our commander can make 0-1s and 2-2s, two so it shouldn't be very hard to get the coven ability of this card. Sun Titan doesn't have any such restrictions, but it is mana intensive to play. Please note, though, that these cards get any permanent from your graveyard onto the battlefield battlefield. This means that not only can we use this to get back important creatures and sack outlets, we also can use this to keep on abusing cards like the aforementioned escape tunnel. Just keep on dropping those sacrificing lands onto the board, triggering landfall ability after landfall ability, and sacrificing them to get even more benefit from them. Sun Titan does a lot of work in smoothing our deck out, especially after we've dredged several of our important cards away. Then we have Emiria Shepherd, who has flying and landfall. Anytime a land enters the battlefield under our control, we can put a non-land permanent from our graveyard into our hand. But if that land is a plains, we can return that card to the battlefield instead. So, once again, cards like Sun Titan allow us to get cards that tutor planes onto the battlefield, triggering Emiria Shepherd and letting us get whatever the hell we want, basically breaking Sun Titan's restriction. Then we have Dread Return, which says return a creature from the graveyard to the battlefield, or you can flash it back to sacrifice three creatures and get that effect again from the graveyard once. This will obviously trigger all of our aristocrats very easily, and we should always have the tokens to use Dread Return. Diagraph Rebirth is a sorcery that lets us get any creature back from the battlefield, to, uh, from the graveyard to the battlefield. Or we can flash it back and its cost is reduced every single time a creature dies during the turn you want to cast it. So sack a bunch of tokens and then cast Diagraph Rebirth for budget costs. Then we have Altar of Ball, which lets us exile a creature we control to return a creature card from the graveyard to the battlefield. I have had some people dislike this card a lot and I understand the feelings of not wanting to exile your stuff in a deck that strictly wants them to die. So instead, I'm going to point out that our commander makes tokens, and we don't care what happens to those tokens. Just exile the creature tokens and use them as food to let Altar of Ball reanimate whatever the hell you want constantly. Then we have Perennial Behemoth, which lets us play lands straight from the graveyard. Finally, there are going to be times where you just need to close the game out post haste, and we have included a surprise I win card in the deck. If you take a look, we have this lovely piece of cardboard called Death to the debtless. We are a green deck, so we generate lots of mana. This card makes every opponent lose two times X life, and you gain life equal to the life lost this way, and I'm totally not shilling this out just because I managed to win games at my LGS with this in my $15 Niv Mizzet deck uh, literally last week, and it was very, very funny. But I'm also saying it because it's a fantastic card, and we are a budget deck that cannot afford Exsanguinate, so we have Exsanguinate at home. 
Now, we've already gone over some of the ways that our deck is going to be drawing through its cards, but we also need to make sure that we have dedicated draw cards whose only purpose is push us further into our deck. It's important to see as many cards in our deck as humanly possible. So, let's go ahead and talk about the draw engines our deck is working with. We have nine cards dedicated solely to this job. Let's begin with Death Reap Ritual. At the beginning of each end step, if a creature died this turn, you may draw a card. Much like with the aforementioned Baron, this is one of those cards that you want to abuse as hard as possible. Make sure that you are staggering your sacrifices and your sack outlets in such a way that the Death Reap Ritual can draw you through your entire deck. Morbid Opportunist is worded the same way. It wants to see a creature die every single turn. So make sure to plan your turns out accordingly. Be spending time every single turn, making sure you know what you're going to be doing on everybody's subsequent turn. Speaking of which, we also have the Welcoming Vampire, which says whenever a creature with power two or less enters the battlefield, draw a card. She only triggers once per turn, so make sure you're doing things like dropping your fetching lands on the board and then waiting a turn and just wait later in the turn cycle so that you can get multiple instances of your commander's ability across the turn cycle, generating more creatures as the turns go on. Then we have Norn's Wellspring. This sees every single time one of our creatures dies, and it lets us scry one to get further into our deck as we use it. And we can also remove two oil counters from it at any point to draw a card. This will let us see most of our deck every single game if we plan accordingly. Mentor of the Meek is like Welcoming Vampire, but costs mana when you use it. Anytime a creature enters the battlefield that has power two or less, pay one and draw a card. We are a green deck. We should have the mana to do that. Then we have some very quick ways to just sack creatures out. Fanatical Offering, Corrupted Conviction, and Merciless Resolve can all sack creatures in order to draw us two cards at instant speed. But Merciless Resolve can also sack lands in order to get that effect as well, which is important because we have cards like Emeria Shepherd and Sun Titan that really want to see certain lands touch the graveyard so we have access to them. Sometimes it's a good idea to look at your Merciless Resolve and wait to cast it until you've got an opening where a Plains is in the graveyard and you can get that Plains back with like a Sun Titan so that you can get a full powered Emeria Shepherd trigger, getting anything you want that's a permanent out of your graveyard. Maybe even getting that Redemption Choir and just going full hog with reanimation everywhere all the time. Just plan your turns accordingly and you should be able to make maximum use of stuff like Merciless Resolve. Then, finally, we have Moldervine Reclamation, which says anytime a creature we control dies, we gain a life and draw us a card. Drawing the card is obviously the main purpose behind this card, but remember that we are always benefiting from this life gain, because this will auto-trigger cards like Dina Soulsteeper and give us more triggers to keep track of, of killing everybody's stuff and burning them to death. So, I, I do want to note that if you are playing Aristocrats for the first time, it can be a bit overwhelming with all of the triggers that you have to keep track of, but after a while it becomes like a puzzle game that's really, really fun to play. I highly suggest trying the strategy out if you haven't already, especially because it just lets you play a different type of game every time. Uh, I'm gonna I'm gonna stop talking about draw cards now because now I'm falling into shilling for uh different aristocrat decks. Anywho, let's move on to the next section. So remember when I told you that sometimes that full power Emeria Shepherd revive is going to be necessary? Well, we're going to talk about the removal and interaction suite in this deck, and the most important piece of removal you have access to is uh, this guy right here, Butcher of Malakir. He's a beefy seven-mana dude who says whenever another creature or it dies, each opponent sacrifices a creature. This is your haymaker. This is the thing that shuts everybody down. This is the thing that causes your friends to leave you at the table and wonder why they were playing magic with you in the first place. I've, I've had this happen before. Please just be very, very careful when you play this card. Butcher of Malakir is an amazing card, but you never want to pay full mana for it, even in a green deck that has access to lots and lots of rampant lands. Please make sure that you are casting this card from the graveyard, or just reviving it from the graveyard. Abuse that Emeria Shepherd ability. Use that of Rebirth. Use Altar of Ball. Use any of those to get this on the board and keep it on the board so our opponents are always having to lose shit to it. 
Then we have access to other types of removal. Bovine uh, Intervention removes an artifact or a creature from the board, killing it, and then giving our opponent a 2-2 Ox creature token in response. We don't care about that token, not really. We just care that their card is gone. We also have Generous Gift, which can kill any permanent. Its controller then makes a 3-3 Elephant token. I've had some people mention that some budget decks really struggle against things like Glacial Chasm. Aristocrats doesn't have that issue, but Generous Gift is a way to remove problematic lands like Generous Chasm or not Generous Chasm <laughs> what the hell am I doing uh, like Glacial Chasm and like Mazes end from the board before they become a problem so please never forget that this card is always there to get you out of a bind then we have D-Spark that can exile any permanent with mana cost 4 or greater Putrefy that can blow up an artifact or a creature, Plague Crafter which will make everybody sack a creature and discard a card if they don't have a creature or planeswalker to sacrifice, Mortify which can blow up a creature or enchantment mortality spear which can destroy any non-land permanent but it costs two less if we've uh, gained any life this turn tasa orzov scion who i'll get into in a second and utter end which can exile any target non-land permanent and is getting power crept in modern horizons 3 because there truly is no god but uh tasa is here and i'm gonna switch to the correct version of tasa real quick because i'm gonna be honest if we're gonna have tasa here we need boob window tasa boob window tasa is correct tasa uh but she cost more than what the deck uh, will allow for so we use different printings anyway tasa Tasa Orzov Scion says we can sacrifice three white creatures to remove a creature from the game, and if a black creature is put into a graveyard from play, then we get to make a 1-1 white spirit creature token with flying. Now, remember, our commander makes black zombie creature tokens, and I've made certain that the only token generation we have in this deck makes either white or black creatures. I distinctly avoided things that made just green plants because I want to make absolute certain that we are able to abuse the absolute absolute fuck out of cards like Tesa or Zoff Scion. Emiria Angel makes white birds, Retreat to Emiria makes white allies, and Ogre Slumlord makes black rats. All of these can be abused by Tasa's various abilities, and honestly, she's another creature who I probably should make an entire deck on. Let me know in the comment section below if you want me to make a deck on Tasa or Zoff Scion. In the meantime, we're going to switch our printing back to a different printing uh, so that the cost of the deck doesn't get too big. I uh, just showed an anime waifu instead of the correct printing. Huh. We're from boob windows and anime waifus, and I'm still trying to figure out why this character died randomly and needed to be... We needed to figure out why she died in an ARG, of all things. I don't know. I'm, I'm very undersold on the idea of murders at Karloff Manor. Anyway, there we go. Sheep Tasa's on the board again. 27 cents, everybody. Play Tasa Karlov. But it's not just single target and sacked removal that we are going to be running. We also want a good bit of board wipes because a lot of our cards will actually see every other card die if a board wipe happens. There are some times where we get to basically just have a board wipe mean that uh, we will win the game due to all of the ways our triggers stack up. So let's talk about our first one one crisis of conscience. We can either blow up all non-land, non-token permanents, getting rid of problematic things like Bolus's citadels and the like, or we can blow up all tokens. This can be a fun way to quickly burn everybody down to their last bit of life and then laugh as every single thing that they've ever loved abandons them. Or we can just use it to get rid of problem cards. Your pick! Your pick! Fumigate can blow up all creatures, and then we gain a life for every creature destroyed this way. That is a fantastic thing, because we like having a huge life total to play around with. And then we have Hour of Reckoning, which can blow up all non-token creatures, getting rid of our opponent's things, but keeping all of our tokens. This is one of the few ways we have that we can uh, make tokens basically swing out for game, instead of just having them function as sack outlets, because sometimes cards like Hour of Reckoning just clear the board enough that an army of 2-2 zombies will hurt them. And, you know, sometimes you just follow that up with a debt to the debt list, and then you laugh maniacally as everybody's loved ones abandon them, as aforementioned. <laughs> Buckle in, because this particular section is going to be quite expansive. We need to have access to lots of ways to abuse our lands, and lots of ways to get lands on the battlefield, since we are playing a Landfall Commander. We do have fewer than I would normally like in a Landfall deck, however, because we are splitting and playing halvesies with an Aristocrat engine and a Landfall engine. So... 
let's go ahead and talk about our 12 card ramp package first before we get to the land package itself. So in the ramp package, we have Dawn Treader Elk, a two mana creature that lets us sack it to get a basic land from our deck onto the battlefield. Emergent Sequence, which lets us sack our, uh, search our library for a basic land, put it on the battlefield tapped, and then make that land a fractal creature token that we can sacrifice as well. This will give us a trigger of our commander generating a token, and then this gives us effectively two creatures we can play with. We should have plenty of lands on the board that sacking a land to this and then getting that land back with a Sun Titan or something is not going to hurt us too terribly much. This is a fun way to get planes we can recycle. And then we have Farhaven Elf, enters the battlefield, search your library for a basic land, put on the battlefield tapped, and of course Farhaven Elf itself is a creature, so we can use that to our advantage, sacking it after it does its job. Its brother Wood Elves is here, it enters the battlefield, lets you search your library for a forest card, put on the battlefield tapped, and then shuffle. Remember, it doesn't say basic forest, and it it doesn't actually say tapped. It just puts it on the battlefield. So Wood Elves can get us any card that is a basic forest or any card that just has forest written on it, like a Canopy Vista, and it'll drop it on the board untapped, so long as you meet whatever untapped requirements those esoteric lands have. Then we have Font of Fertility, which is just Dawn Treader Elk again. Uh, and then we have Roiling Regrowth, which lets us sack a land and search our library for two basic lands and put them on the battlefield tapped. Then we have Wayfarer's Bobble, which is just Font of Fertility again, which was just Dawn Treader Elk again. But this one's colorless. Pay one to drop it on the board, pay two to sack it and get a basic land from our deck onto the battlefield. Then we have Core Cartographer. This will enter the battlefield, get a planes on the battlefield tapped and put it, it's just, it, it's, it's Wood Elves, but it gets a planes but the card comes into play tapped instead of untapped. It's strictly worse Wood Elves, but in white. Then we have Growth Spasm. Search your library for a basic land, put it on the battlefield, and then make an 0-1 Colorless Eldrazi spawn, which we can sack to generate a mana. So this is generating us two mana, one quick and easy pseudo treasure, and one land. And with that sp uh, token itself, having its own sack ability, we can use this to trigger various other things we've talked about in the deck so far that work to our benefit when we sacrifice things. Then we have Frontier Guide, a two-mana elf that lets us search our library for a basic land and put it on the battlefield tapped at instant speed so long as we have the four mana and ability to tap it. This can help us churn through our deck very, very quickly to get lots and lots of lands out. Then we have Search for Tomorrow, search your library for a basic land, put it on the battlefield, and then shuffle your library. Notably, it has Suspend 2, so we can actually play this on turn 1 for its Suspend cost, and then get its effects on turn 3 without paying any mana, and the land comes into play untapped. So it's just straight acceleration for us. Then we have Spring Bloom Druid, which enters the battlefield, lets you sack a land and search your library for two basic lands and put them on the battlefield tapped. It's effectively Roiling Regrowth, but it has a body that we can abuse to hell and high water and back because we are an aristocrat deck and every single creature that we have ha has two lives. One life when it's on the board and one life when we fucking kill it. Then we got to talk about the very, very big 39 card land section. First, we got 18 basic lands here, which I sometimes feel like is too few for the type of deck that we're playing. But you know what? I think that we've got to make do with what we've got here. Then we've got six dual lands we have access to, and each one has been picked for a very specific role. Canopy Vista can come into play untapped, obviously, but notably it is a forest plains. Haunted Mire is a Forest Swamp, Scattered Grove is a Forest Plains, and Snowfield Sinkhole is a Plains Swamp. This means cards like our Core Cartographer, and a card we're going to talk about later, can grab multiple of these dual lands out of the deck, which makes it far more easy for us to be mana positive while also giving us our different colors that we need. Sometimes you need multiple pips in various colors and having these helps out a ton and is well worth the sacrifice of them being tapped lands. Speaking of tapped lands that are well worth the sacrifice, we also have the Selesnian Sanctuary and Orzov Basilica. I've only put two of these bounce lands in instead of three for space reasons, but both of these serve a very particular function in our deck. You will almost never actually bounce a different land to your hand unless it's like a planes that you desperately need to drop down for a Myria Shepherd's effect. Most of the time, unless you are trying to sculpt early game, you want to drop one of these lands down and then bounce itself to your uh, to your hand. If it's late enough in the game, you should have plenty of mana, and the only purpose these lands serve anymore is to let you trigger your commander's ability over and over again in the event that you do not have access to other lands 
lands, either from your ramping abilities, your fetching abilities, or the deck just running out of lands in general. I've played landfall decks that have ran out of lands even when the decks have like 42 land mana bases. My AC deck runs out of lands with a 42 man uh, land mana base. So I always try to put in one or two of these bounce lands into them because even though they come into play tapped and even though they are not typed and do not benefit us in most of the ways that dual lands would, they do let us sculpt early because they tap for two and they turn a two lane hand effectively into a three lane hand with downsides. But most importantly, they do let us get that effect of the commander over and over and over again when we are effectively landless. So that's my spiel. Use them, but now we've got the big area. 12 fetching lands. Every one of these lands can get a different land from our deck, effectively letting us double up on our commander's ability. And people said fetch lands are only for people with money. Ha! We're budget players. We've got lots of options. Let's start with Escape Tunnel since I talked about it already. Sack it to get a basic land from your library and put it onto the battlefield. Super easy to understand. Terramorphic Expanse is the same thing, and Evolving Wilds is the same thing. Then we have Blighted Woodland, which can sack itself to get two basic lands from your deck. Same with Myriad Landscape. And finally, Frozen Verge in this get two lands out of your deck triumphant of amazing cards. Frozen Verge comes into play tapped, which sucks, but we can sack it, get a forest and a plains onto the battlefield, which means we can use it to get a scattered groves and then a snowfield sinkhole on the battlefield, basically giving us every single one of our deck's colors really early on without any other muss or fuss. Frozen Verge is amazing, and anytime somebody says that they need to cut it out of a precon to upgrade it, they are wrong and they have sinned. Please remember, K-Verge is a wonderful card that always has your back when sculpting your hand. Then we have Cabretti Courtyard, Brokers, Hideout, and Riveteer's Outlook. Each of these effectively drop onto the battlefield, gain us a life, and then search out a basic land to put onto the battlefield. They'll tell you which ones they can search out, not all of them can get all the colors that our deck is because Wizards doesn't love us and hasn't printed every single one of their lands in this variety. We have a five land cycle that is not complete and doesn't have Abzan as one of its options. But these also gain us a life when they ETB, which means that we will be triggering cards like Marauding Blight Priest and Dina Soul Steeper more times than normal. Then we've got Shire Terrace and Promising Vein and Jund Panorama. Each of these cards allows us to have an untapped land that can pay one and sack itself to get a basic land from our deck onto the battlefield. These are fantastic lands, and I think if you're a budget player, you should have a stockpile of these because they don't cost a lot. Your LGS is probably selling them for pennies, and they help sculpt land bases for any budget up until the point where you have a ton of dual lands that you simply do not have need for these anymore. But if you are playing with a low budget, which is what my channel is primarily aimed at, these things are stellar, especially since our commander likes seeing lands that it can go, oh, you play this on turn one, and then on turn two, you get to sack it to get whatever I need, or if the commander's out, we can start using these to get multiple instances of our commander's ability. Then we have a few special lands. These are the Omni lands of the deck that can tap for whatever our deck normally wants. Beginning with a command tower, very, very simple. Gets one mana of any type for your commander. But the other two are very special. We have a Murmuring Bosk and Pit of Offerings. Let's start with the Pit of Offerings. We're a budget deck, so we can't afford a Bajuka Bog at the moment, but it does enter the battlefield tapped, and it can tap for the colors of anything that it exiles in the graveyard, and it gets to exile three target cards from people's graveyards. This is a pseudo Bajuka Bog, and once you get a Bajuka Bog while upgrading the deck, it's perfectly reasonable to run both of these, especially because the Pit of Offerings can be reused in one of the few situations you would actually drop one of the bounce lands and keep the bounce land on the battlefield. Being able to do things like reuse Pit of Offerings means that we have control of other players' graves yards, and that keeps reanimation players honest. We are the only reanimation players allowed to cheat at the table. Then we have Murmuring Bosk, a forest that can tap for green, black, or white. I swear to god, Bant is spoiled with this card. It, we can reveal a tree folk to make it not come into play tapped, but let's be honest, the real thing we're going to be doing with Murmuring Bosk is crapping a Crozen Verge and making sure that Murmuring Bosk comes onto the battlefield tapped, but ready to give us whatever mana that we want. 
I, I love Murmuring Bosk. I love any time a deck lets me play a Murmuring Bosk. But that is our land and ramp section, and we're not done yet because I've already talked a little bit about upgrading the deck, so what would happen if you actually had some money to drop on the deck later? Let's say that you have the budget to spend on upgrading our deck. Let's see what you would want. First of all, I would go for a Knight of the Reliquary. It gets 1-1 one, one for every land in your grave, but the important part is to sack a Forest or Plains. You search your library for a land to put on the battlefield and then shuffle your library. Puts it on the battlefield untapped, notably, so we can use this as a wonderful ramping piece for a turn. Also, the fact that this can get just another Plains to replace the land that it gets, and it can search out one of our utility lands, is fantastic in our deck. Remember that getting a planes up does mean that we can re-abuse things like a Myria Shepherd. We also, with the Modern Horizons 3 release, will have access to White of the Reliquary, which lets us sack a creature to search our library for a land and put it in the battlefield tapped, which is a wonderful way to double up on Knight of the Reliquary's abilities. And also, it lets us be sad that she is no longer among us. Then, as for lands, I would definitely go for a Bajuka Bog, doubling up on our ability to fuck with people's graves. Field of the Dead is also fantastic, as it is just a lieutenant for our commander, but it is very, very pricey. Urza's Cave is a new fetching land that we'll have access to after Modern Horizons 3 comes out. Sack it, search your library for any land card, and put on the battlefield tapped. This is fantastic. It's a crop rotation, not in green. But if we are trying to grab specific lands, Sylvan Scrying is going to do a lot of work for us as well. But, speaking of lands, we want the ability to play them from our graveyard, so I would add in a Conduit of Worlds, which also lets us reanimate creatures if it is the only thing that we are doing. Uh, we get to basically get any non-land permanent from our graveyard and put it on the battlefield if we pay its mana cost at sorcery speed, and only once a turn, and only if it's the only thing that we do. It's a very restrictive reanimate, but it is a cool one. Insidious Roots will let us get double use out of all of our creature tokens, turning them into mana dorks. Gary, a uh, Grey Merchant of Asphodel, is a wonderful way to just close out games and is a great uh, substitute or addition to the Debt to the Deathless winning strategy. Skull Clamp is another way to get a lot of just draw power out of our tokens. Spelunking is fantastic, making sure that our lands that come out of the battlefield will not actually come to the battlefield tapped. Uh, and if we drop a cave down with this, we get to gain four life, triggering Dina. Yeah. And then we have Gitrog Monster and Thalia and the Gitrog Monster. Both of them gave us access to the ability to sack our lands and draw cards as we do so. Thalia is also a sack outlet for creatures as well. And she could just be the uh, second commander or even the primary commander of this deck if you so chose. We have Sir Conrad the Grin and Zillaport Cutthroats as more ways to generate aristocrat behavior from our deck if you want some of the more powerful options. And finally, Reassembling Skeleton will do tons of work for you because it does not say summon, it just puts it from the graveyard onto the battlefield at instant speed on anybody's turn, uh, letting us do silly things like trigger our welcoming vampire over and over again on other people's turns. Reassembling skeletons also part of several infinite uh, mana strategies that we have access to. And uh, like I said before, sack outlets are cool, Ashnod's altar is fantastic, Ashnod's and Phyrexian altar both are just amazing options for this deck in that they let you get mana for sacking all of your creatures. So that's what I would do if I had infinite money instead of $15 to work with. Finally, I have to say I hope you're as excited for Necro Bloom as I am for when it comes out. I'm not trying to be a shill for MH3. I'm not hugely a fan of how this particular set is being marketed. Not a really, I'm not happy about the pre-con situation. But what I am happy about is that we are getting some really interesting commander spaces in this set. And Necro Bloom is just a great way of having more ways to abuse really, really love the strategies in Commander. I love Landfall. I love Aristocrats. Another Commander that lets me marry the two is just a just straight-up win in my book. So... I hope you guys end up enjoying the deck. Let me know if you plan on building Necro Bloom yourself uh, in the comment section below. And also let me know if you've got any suggestions for these videos or new commanders that you want to see or anything at all. Just go ahead and drop me any info down there. I'd love to hear from y'all. Thank you for watching this video. And I'm sorry that it came out as late as it did. As always, y'all, insert end the video tagline here.
Hey, I just quickly want to give a thank you to all of my wonderful patrons who keep this show running. YouTube and Twitch are a pretty bumpy ride at the best of times, and the stability a Patreon provides me is worth more than I can say here. I'd also like to thank each and every one of my $20 and up patrons here. They would be Red Joker, Britzkrieg, Cameron, Dren, Gemshin, Smiling DM, Poundini, Nabity Babity, Naomi, Isaac, Agamotto, Jordan, Ravi, Juni, Kiratorian, Prisma, all of you. Sagitta, I'm not saying that part. And Starlight. And finally, thank you to everyone else that helps keep this channel alive. While you're here, why not check out another video? And thank you for watching.